Welcome to the Misophonia Podcast. This is episode five of season two. My name is Adil Ahmad, and I have Misophonia. This week, yet another conversation with someone in Europe, a longtime listener, Jill. This is really a wide ranging conversation that gets into, of course, his background of parents not supporting his condition, even to this day, experimenting with ayahuasca and psychedelics, being unable to eat with his own daughter. And he talks a lot about the work of Tom Dozier, a well-known behaviorist who has published books, videos, and apps on misophonia. And trust me, there's a lot more in this conversation. Shout out again to the misophonia convention that will be on in October and online later this year on October 8th. They actually just asked me to do a session about the first year of this podcast. I don't think registration has started yet, but just follow the Misophonia Association on social media for the latest announcements. I'll have links in the show notes for that. If it was in person, I'd have tons of podcast stickers to hand out. But if you want one, just send me your mailing address, either by email, hello at misophoniapodcast.com, or DM me on Instagram or Facebook at misophoniapodcast, or on Twitter at Misophonia Show. Just a warning that when we get into Jules' past, there is some mention of self-harm behavior, but it's brief, and I assure you, Jill's story is super positive and inspiring to me, and I hope all of you. Here's my fascinating conversation with Jill. Jill, uh, welcome, welcome to the podcast. Good to have you here. Good to finally talk to you um, voice to voice. I, I know I've been uh, seeing you on the Instagram for a while. Yeah, I, I've been trying to uh, raise awareness as much as I could by, you know, reposting every time we were posting a new episode, trying to push it a bit, doing my part. As you probably know, I usually like, just like to start off with uh, um, asking, like, kind of where, where you're located. Yeah, uh, I'm in Stockholm, in Sweden. Um, I'm a French guy living in Stockholm for 10 years now. Gotcha, um, so, okay. So I'm a st- stranger in a strange land. Yeah, what, what kind of, uh, what type of work do you do? Uh, I'm a strategy consultant. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I have a background in engineering, which I've heard is a very common thing in people with misophonia. Yeah, yeah. I heard, I heard, I mean, I heard that from uh, Dr. John, Dr. Marsha Johnson, who said uh, a large chunk of her clients are, um, are engineers. So, yeah, I heard something um, like one out of three had uh, some yeah. kind of engineering background, which is amazing to me. And so do you work in, uh, what kind of environment do you work in? Are you working from, well, you might be working from home these days, but uh, yeah. <laughs> is it uh, typically like an office environment as a consultant? Yeah, typically it's uh, you know, a usual, usual office, open space type of yeah. environment. Um, right now, I mean, for the last six weeks, it's been working from home, um, which comes with all kinds of new challenges, actually. You, you yeah. might think, I've heard people saying that from a misophonia perspective, it was a, it was a really good thing. Uh, I've had kind of the opposite uh, experience, uh, but we can get into that. Yeah, why don't we? Yeah, maybe why don't we start there? I know, um, I know, yeah. I know it's top of mind for a lot of people these days. And I, I have you're right. I've had people, uh, past guests, write in say they want to do an update, um, talking about how great it is. And, uh, and yeah, there are probably good things. But I'm curious from your perspective, uh, what are some of the challenges you're you're facing now? Uh, well, what I found out is that when you work from home you know you only have online meetings you know calls like this for example yeah um, after a while people get very relaxed at home and then you have a lot of people chewing or eating or tapping something in the background you know and then you know when you have like four or five people in a call and there's some some one of those four or five people is doing something like that um and and it's passed through the audio very clearly to you yep and when you spend hours like that in a day, you know, on a normal day when I can actually go to an office, I can find some space where I'm alone or I can put my headphones on and you know, kind of shield myself from the noise around me. Uh, but when you have to work uh, with people online like that, you can't really do that. You can't mute everyone. That's a good point. Yeah, you can, in an office, you can kind of go to a, you can leave the space, but basically yeah. in a virtual meeting, you've basically invited every space in the office into your, directly into your ear. Exactly. You that, that's the issue. And unless you find exactly who, you know, who 
is making the noise that is triggering you, it's really hard. Actually. And it's uh, somehow selectively mute. Um, yeah, you know. and I and I tried to to ask several times, you know, like I have a very annoying noise in the background, you know, can you please make sure you're not doing this or that? But it it's funny. Work. A couple of days ago, I actually I, I actually asked somebody to stop eating during <laughs> during a meeting, yeah. and uh, yeah, it was funny because uh, you know they get the usual reaction as you know some some giggling or snickering as if uh, oh yeah it's just annoying kind of thing. But so, uh, something that people might not know is that when you're using your laptop that way and uh, you're using the touchpad on your laptop, and instead of no, or while you're in a meeting, you're actually browsing the internet or you know doing something on your laptop. Every time you click on your touchpad, that makes that noise. Oh yeah, I mean the microphone's right in the same uh, same, yeah. same box, exactly and there's there. no there's no padding or anything. So yeah, no. I mean it came with a uh, you no know, different challenges compared to a normal work and our environment. Right. So I wouldn't say it has improved in any way. Right. It just, it just moved things in a different space. Do you have a lot of meetings then? Are you kind of constantly? Uh, no, things have, have been more quiet. I mean, have been better for me, but I had a good six weeks where it was an average of six to seven hours of online meetings every day. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that drove me crazy. Yeah, yeah. The uh, right, the virtual meeting thing is yeah. And how about the rest of your uh, space at home? Is it pretty, pretty quiet, pretty isolated? Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, I, I live alone. Um, I'm separated from the mother of my kid, mm -hmm. so uh, so I'm on my own most of the time. So it's uh, it's very quiet otherwise, and my apartment is very well insulated. So I'm I'm not suffering from any you know neighbor noise or anything like that. It's uh, it's usually pretty quiet. Yeah. So maybe we should uh, let's let's swing back then to um, to early to early Jill uh, to young Jill, um, or maybe or maybe not. Um, a lot, some people have gotten misophonia later in life, and I'm curious, kind of, um, when 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 things kind of started for you. Literally, for as long as I can remember, um, like even very early memories. I must have been you know, in, even in preschool, so around the age of four. I already remember being annoyed by the the noises from other kids during lunch, or when kids were were eating candies or things like that. It was already at the time it was annoying me. Um, do you remember uh, bringing it? Do you remember how you reacted at that age? Um, I remember being annoyed, but I remember the, and it, it might sound very uh, similar to other people. I remember the first time I got really angry, you know, you know that typical yeah. you know, internal boiling sensation that misophonia triggers. Um, it was next to my, to my dad. He was chewing those gums, you know, that people use to stop smoking. Uh huh. And he was chewing the, the, that gum like so loudly, and um, to this day, that just that memory makes me. I mean, it, it triggers me. That one memory, or, or just, yeah, yeah, wow. Just, uh, yeah, just yeah. just thinking back to to that moment, and that I moment. and I remember that that I think that's one of the earliest memories I have of um, feeling that anger inside me. You know, you know, why is he making that noise? You know, why can't he stop that? It's it was torture to me. How did you start to deal with it, or if you dealt with it? Um, it, it has affected every aspect of my um, social life, um, in, um, mostly in negative ways um, growing up. Um, so I, I, starting at home, you know, when your parents are triggering you, because it wasn't only my dad, you know, then it's uh, yeah. any kind of chewing noise. Um, and my parents didn't really understand any of that. So every time I complained about the noises they were making, they were something was wrong wrong with me, basically. So um, gotcha. And did you have any siblings as well, or was it primarily? Yeah, I have two, I have two sisters, and uh, one of them actually developed misophonia later on. So uh -huh. not as a child, but later on growing up. Um, but um, yeah, my parents were not supportive at all. Right? Did and they ever? Even to this day, yeah, they, they, they don't understand. You know, like the loud chewing um, during dinner, or um, you know, let's talk about triggers. So it's uh, mostly the chewing noises, 
than the sound that people make when they, you know, suck on, suck on the f- or lick their fingers. Right, right. You know? Did uh, did you do anything like um, I don't know, leave dinner early? Like, did you do any kind of? Oh, yeah. you know, you know how we have all have our micro micro strategies. I mean, growing up, I had all kinds of reactions to the, that from uh, starting to isolate myself during lunch and dinner time. So having dinner on my own or just having an outburst of anger at the dinner table. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then leaving, you know, it's, uh, at that age, you don't really, don't really know what's going on. So. Yeah, exactly. And, um, it, it really affected how I, how I built my, you know, my social life. And because it was like that at home, it was like that in school. So I was a very, um, very lonely, lonely kid most of the time because there was always that thing. And for a long period of time, time, I didn't really know what was bothering me so much with other people. Yeah. Um, so did you, this, uh, um, what, did you make friends and then, and then slowly kind of step away from them or was it, you just kind of, were you starting to avoid people in general and just not approaching people? I had very few friends. Um, and, and even with friends, I mean, I, I, I prefer eating on my own, for example, during lunch. I still do, actually, <laughs> to this day, yeah. even though yeah, even, know, even I have more friends. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that, that didn't make things easier, you know, that didn't make things easier to make friends, you know, when you have that, um, that thing um, and when you have these really strong reactions. And, um, yeah, the, the, there was really no support at home. Um, and... At the time when I was a kid in the eighties and early nineties, uh, you know, that that term wasn't wasn't there really. I mean, oh no, knew. it was still years away from yeah. No. So if you were, you know, when if I were to ask a teacher to uh, ask another kid to stop chewing or you know to be moved somewhere else, you know, the, the teacher would not understand. It's uh, there was always something wrong with me. Right. Did did uh, did you ever get teased by anybody like students or even teachers? Oh yeah, and, and even my parents. Gotcha. So, and I'm assuming, well, let me, I should ask, but like, was a lot of mimicking of the sounds, you know, the, the usual crap that we yeah. all get. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, making the sounds, the sound or exaggerating it, actually making it louder. Yeah. No, it's like, oh, you complain about how loud I'm, I'm chewing that thing. Well, let me show you how loud I can chew it. You know? Right. Like, You're right. Yeah. Uh, Real mature. Um, yeah. gotcha. And then, um, and, and how did it affect maybe like, uh, grades and, and school? Obviously you're doing well <laughs> now, it seems, um, did it, uh, yeah, did it affect well, your grades? There was a couple of instances where I remember tests were made very difficult by that. Torturous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there was one test, I, I was still young, it must have been eight, something like that. I just couldn't do it. I sat in the classroom and um, there, there was a kid that was sucking on something or chewing something and the noise was driving me crazy. It was, um, it was unbearable. And uh, I mean, I, I got a terrible score on that test and it's not because I did, I couldn't have done it. It's just, yeah, like, uh, I was Your sitting on my shut chair. Down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. I was shutting down, just waiting for it to be over. Like, just let me go out, like, please, just let me leave the room. Right. And so, um, and then did, um, I'm sure this obviously continued um, later and into maybe, um, I went into like college and stuff, did it, did it start to, you know, at that point you get some choice in terms of like what you want to study and kind of where you want to live a little bit. Um, yeah. You start so, to take so, advantage of um, some of that. So you uh, get more choice in terms of where you want to sit in a room. Yeah. Um, so I've learned that sitting you know, at the very far back of the room, so not having anyone behind me, uh, helps a lot. Actually. As long as as long as you're not, as, yeah, as long as you don't see anybody in front of you visually trigger you. Um, um, yeah, the the visual trigger is interesting, um, but but I think um, as long as it's not directly behind me or next to me, I have yeah. I have uh, an easier time to deal with it. That's good. Um, but yeah, the, the visual part is, uh, is still something. So if I see somebody chewing from afar, even if I can't hear it, I will yeah. get triggered. Um, yep. But I think it's an acquired, uh, some kind of acquired um, 
trigger that that originate from the initial uh, no, audio trigger. Yeah, it's something that most most people I think uh, identify as having started later. It's probably your brain just kind of giving you some more advanced warning. I don't know if you, you must be familiar with um, Dr. Tom Dozier. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah, he has, at the conventions, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he, he has built um, a model for misophonia that explains how the, the trigger works and is processed by the brain uh, and how that process, uh, that, that way of processing the trigger by the brain uh, can actually uh, make it easier for you to acquire new triggers. Uh, that's um, not good news, but <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's not good news, but... but no, I know. I'm, I'm, being, I'm <laughs> kidding. It's not good news, but uh, once you understand that process, actually, you can yeah. be a bit different. Um, and um, it's something I wished I, I wish I had known you know, years before. Oh gosh, yeah. There's a lot of stuff uh, I wish we'd known. Um, and and, and, oh, and when did you, when did you when did you hear about misphonia being a being a thing? Um, I. Um, I started dating someone at the end of 2018 and um, like a few weeks into the relationship, I told her, you know, um, I, I have that thing, you know, I have, I have some noises that I just can't stand. So, uh, you know, people chewing loudly, chewing gums or, you know, she, she would not do it very often, but she would lick her fingers mm -hmm. eating something. And I told her, you know, typically when you do that, it drives me nuts. <laughs> um, and she first started to try to lecture me, saying, you know, you're always in charge of your mindset. And, you know, oh, you have right. no response to everything. You know, the typical mindfulness thing. Um, but I told her, you know, I guarantee you I can't control that. And she, she listened and she did some research and she actually found that movie, you know, Quiet Please. Yeah, yeah, great movie. Yeah, and we watched it together. And um, I was like, that's me. And they made a movie about me and I wasn't aware of it. Yeah. So you only found out really, just a couple of years ago, if that. And at the end of uh, 2018. Yeah. So. Wow. Okay. How, how did you get through? How did you um, did you get through that movie all in one sitting? I, I found I just couldn't. Uh, it was just too yeah. strong. Too strong. Uh, too strong. Yeah, yeah. I had to pause I, I it did. and come back to it. I, I went through it in one sitting, and it was uh, yeah. Yeah. I would be lying <laughs> it's, if, it's I, if I you know if I would say that I wasn't getting emotional. Or something. Yeah. Movie. Okay. It, uh, especially that um, that lady, I don't remember her name, that uh, had a very severe misophonia and she had been, you know, harming herself in the past. Uh, so, yeah. And that, that was me, exactly me. Like when, because, uh, you know, all the social anxiety that comes with that thing, you know, the, the issues with relating to others and bonding with others. Uh, by the time I, I became a teenager, I think when I was 16, something like that, I started harming myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I did that for several years. Um, and as I see now, you know, watching that movie, it was OK. So there's clearly a link between that type of behavior and the, the pain that comes from misophonia. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that movie was an eye opener. It was OK there. So it's, uh, it's something that has a name. That, that was a relief in some way. Oh. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It is when you, whenever you talk to somebody, when you see um, um, piece, a piece like that um, for a while, and then, uh, <laughs> then the triggers do, uh, do come back. Um, yeah. and, and going back to kind of, uh, you, you, so earlier today, you sent me some of the artwork that you've drawn, and I'll post those when this, when this goes live, if, if that's okay with you on, on well, Instagram. Great. Yeah, but I'm curious. Um, when, when did you when did you draw those? Were those recent, or were those maybe um, drawings as you were growing up, going through some of these uh, episodes? No, yeah, some some of them are you know, like only um, a couple of weeks old. Um, some some of them are a couple of years old, a couple of years old. Um, I, I think. Well, um, that, that's one actually one of my coping mechanisms. You know. Um, when I'm in meetings, for example, and there is somebody like sucking on a mint or chewing gum or something like that in, in the room, uh, I start drawing on my notebooks. So I can actually tell you, you know, looking at my notebooks, I can tell you if somebody was making noises <laughs> and looping or not, because if there is a drawing like that somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> like somebody, was make, somebody was triggering me. Uh, 
it, it's a way for me to kind of remove myself from the room. Yep, focus your mind on like, something else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I focus on something else. So I start drawing stuff on my notebooks. Um, I should, usually, I should learn to draw. <laughs> usually making sure nobody else sees my drawings because that could trigger some um, questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, one or, one or two of these for sure. Um, yeah. And and do you have any, uh, yeah, so speaking of my coping mechanisms, um, so drawing, that's a great one, just to kind of like an art, artistic outlet. Um, what are some of your your opening, uh, your coping mechanisms? I see, I see from your Instagram, you, uh, you're uh, in quite good shape and, and like to work out. I'm wondering if, uh, if that's yeah. another coping mechanism. Uh, that, that's actually, um, that, that's how I stopped uh, harming myself, actually starting going to the gym. Ah. So... Um, when I was 21, 22, uh, I entered the gym and thought, you know, rather than cutting myself, maybe I should build something a bit. So I started exercising quite regularly. Um, so that's definitely been an outlet for stress and anxiety you know, in some way. That's great. Wow, you've got some very productive, uh, that's very inspiring. Um, gyms, though, are can be rough. Uh, I see from your yeah. pictures that you do usually have uh, headphones, which uh, yeah. is probably I, a must. I would, <laughs> I would never go to the gym without my, uh, my earbuds. Um, right. That's, uh, you know, when you're, when you're on a bike or when you know, sitting somewhere on the bench and the, the girl next to you is chewing like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> right. It, it can be very annoying. Um, yep. So I, I can't imagine going to public places without my uh, my earbuds, you know, at least in my pocket. Yeah, exa- yeah, and it, it's at least good to have in your. Just knowing that I think you have um, something on you, you don't necessarily yeah. have to wear it. I think it provides some relief. Yeah, so that's and, one way I cope with it is to is to have those earbuds on me uh, almost all the time, even if I'm not wearing them. At least I know that I can know that they're here. Um, I have those uh, Bose uh, noise canceling he- headphones too. Mm-hmm. Um, they're really good for like um, no, taking the train or you know, the bus or an airplane or anything. Uh, they're a life changer, really. Um, but my main coping mechanism now is to anticipate situations and not step into those situations. Yep. So, uh, for example, at work. Um, now that I'm a bit more senior, I have more control over things like lunch meetings, for example. So anytime somebody is like, oh, let's have a lunch meeting, I'm like, no. Nope. You're fired. No. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> but, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, you want to eat, you eat, you want to have a meeting, we have a meeting, but we're not going to have a lunch meeting. It's, uh, yes, um, yes. Well, that or, should be, written in, that should be uh, in a, written in management books, I believe. Yeah, and uh, I mean, not only is it a sure way to trigger me, but also you, usually when you plan a one hour lunch meeting, the first 20 minutes are spent discussing what is there for lunch. Right. And then the last 10 minutes are, uh, are you know, just gathering the leftovers and, you know, cleaning the room and things like that. So it's, uh, it's a sure way of cutting in half the productivity, the productive time of the meeting and also the chewing noises. So I, now I'm good at avoiding things like that. Uh, also when, um, Working with you know more junior people in, in my teams, I have those rules like, uh, and I try to joke when I introduce my you know working rules. But it's like, okay, rule number one: we show up on time. Rule number two, which might actually be rule number one, is if I'm anywhere in your field of view, you don't eat or chew or you know do anything like that. And, and and I try to try to joke a bit when I introduce those rules, but people get the message. Um, <laughs> as long as they get the message, yes. And, uh, you know, maybe being, uh, you know, maybe being six foot two and uh, 220 pounds. <laughs> and working out that much. Yeah, hey, that's probably another advantage that people will probably listen to you a little bit more carefully yeah. with that, with the amount of time you spend at the gym. And, and, when, you, and when you introduce these rules, um, does anyone ask, like, why? And maybe have you, like, maybe discovered other misophony sufferers at work? So until, and before I knew about the term misophonia, for me it was just okay. Th- those are the rules, unless oh, you want to yeah. be nuts and yeah. face the consequences of me being nuts. Um, <laughs> those are the rules. Um, but now that I can put a name on it, I can actually be very open and say okay, I have that condition. So that's why I want you not to chew anything next to me. What do people say? 
Um, I would Just say don't most hurt people, me. <laughs> most people are are fine with it, and then you you always have you know the the odd person who will who will almost use it against you, and that's um, I think that's human nature. You can't avoid that. So it's oh, uh, even at work. Yeah, every time you bring that up, you're you know it's a risk you take of um, you know giving something to someone to to harm you. Um, so that happens. Um, g good thing that I uh, know with the podcast, for example, and uh, you know raising awareness on social networks, for example, like that I, I have a, a colleague who one day saw one of one of my posts where I actually reposted um, an episode of the podcast and. Uh, he asked me, "What is it?" So you know now, now, now that this is this is out, this is out there now. You know, we're talking about misophonia as a, yeah. as a thing. Uh, people can come and ask. So okay, so you're you're saying you're suffering from that thing. What is it? So I have people that kind of coming to me and asking me questions, which is that had never happened before because just the awareness wasn't there. So yeah. no, there's something. It's it's getting around in the air, like. Um... Like I said, there there's still a long way to go, but uh, that's great. Uh, I think hearing other people talk about it uh, outside of like the you know the Facebook group rants, like just these one-on-one -on -one conversations, hopefully, kind of um, kind of help. Um, and yeah, another thing I was thinking about, I've been thinking about, um, is trying to um, you know you, you're talking about your work environment, just trying to get um, the human resources groups to to know more about it, so that they can kind of. Uh, um, try to retain employees longer or maybe make it easier for Miss Funny sufferers, especially if there's a lot of engineers out there, to feel comfortable applying to certain companies. Yeah, I heard that uh, in, in the U.S. this is recognized as um, as an actual condition that an employer has to do something about. Yeah. I have no idea if that's the case in Sweden. Um, uh, yeah, it's the American Disabilities uh, Act. Yeah, and so a lot of people have been using that in, in like colleges and also so work environments. So yeah, that, that's a fantastic thing. Uh, I need to look into that here in Sweden if we have something similar because I, I think there are a lot of people who are who might not even know that you know what misophonia is that right. are suffering from that from that. And, uh, and I think productivity can you know if if you have a bunch of high you know like expensive uh, employees who have it and maybe you know are at eighty percent productivity that can make a big impact yeah. to the bottom line. It, it's it definitely impacting my productivity. So I would assume it's impacting you know other people with the mm -hmm. same kind of productivity. It's you know when I say I'm drawing you know on my notebooks when somebody's chewing in a meeting. Well, while I'm drawing, I'm not hundred percent paying attention to what's being said. Right. Yeah, that's you know as simple as that um i actually left a couple of meetings saying yeah uh, sorry i you know like i, I excuse myself and i said sorry I, I have to get out so um i had situations where i told some people you know abruptly please stop making that noise and that just killed the the, the conversation you know that just killed the you know, any will to collaborate then to, to do something productive. Oh, <laughs> you know, it's a total buzz kill, total momentum yeah. killer. Yeah. Um, and, and also, you no, know, I understand that, you know, somebody who is chewing a gun, not really paying attention to that, you know, being yelled at, you know, please stop making that noise. I imagine the shock of that person, but then also it takes a lot of energy from me because that person only sees me, you know, being very angry and having that outburst. But that person doesn't see, you know, the, the long minutes building up to that outburst. And those long minutes of me, you know, keeping things inside, they take a lot of energy. And That's a good point. Me. I think uh, when people kind of, you know, mock this or don't, don't take it seriously, they, only, they don't see how much it gets bottled up in, in, in advance. And, how, you know, it, if there's an outburst, it doesn't come out lightly. It's like there's a lot no. of uh, prep time, you know. There's a lot of build up, and yeah. that build up takes a lot of energy, and it takes a, you know a lot of energy to keep it inside, and then, and then when you let something out, you you don't want to smash that person's face, so you know you just try to say something for legal uh, reasons, yeah. But <laughs> you, you, you try to say something as quiet, you know, as calmly as possible and as politely as possible, and that takes you know even more energy. Yep. Yeah. But that's visible it. to to the outside. That's you know, it's you and only you who is aware of how much energy you just burned trying not to explode. 
So yeah, that kills that kills productivity for sure. It can make you fail a test, but it can you it can make you completely miss the point of uh, of an important meeting at work. Yep. And have you have you told your um, obviously you, you, does your boss know? Do you do you use your boss in the same kind of environment, office space? No. So I haven't talked to my direct boss really about that. Uh, I tend to more talk about that with people who work directly with me every day. Yeah. Okay. I think I haven't had really the. Uh, it's not really something that I'm still, you know, bringing up first thing I meet with someone. Or... Yeah, yeah. That's the other thing um, I like to ask is like um, even outside of work. Like, um, well, I guess you've only known about it for well, you've known about it for a couple of years, but it's been bothering you obviously for a while. Like, when when you do um, meet people for for friends or whatever, when do you do when you bring it up? Is it after a number of triggers or is it like once you trust a person yeah i think it's after uh, I, I need i need this to i need to trust the person with it. because if it's you know if it's somebody i don't really mind or someone i'm not planning on seeing again or you know seeing very often i might not even bother yeah have you ever gotten um, like a negative has anyone dared <laughs> look at you and kind of dare um argue argue back or whatever i guess you know since childhood oh well, yeah like uh, um, like in, like adults um in the past yeah you know, i uh, mean the, the first ones to do that were my parents oh yeah of course i mean they, they never understood them to this day i don't think they understand um and so yeah. did you how did you how did you tell them that it, did it have did you sit did you talk to them since uh did you talk to them about it since you found out it had a name like approach them with a bunch of articles and whatnot um and try to get them to see the light or um, I, I tried that uh, last year to bring it up. Uh, I was at my parents for my 40th birthday, um, and, and I had brought up the topic before, and it didn't change a thing. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it was um, just the same thing as usual. Um, yeah. So I actually left my 40th birthday earlier than planned. Because, oh, okay. Um, uh, and. and uh, was it more of a disappointment or was it just uh, with the triggers were too much? It's both. It's really, yeah. you know, and, and the, the thing is because, because the, the response is so emotional, you know, any, any, anything like disappointment is actually just adding up to it. It's just multiplying it. Oh, it wears you down. Uh, like, like, yeah, just like, uh, it's exhausting. Yeah. And uh -huh. but you mentioned that, um, and, but you mentioned that, that your sibling, when you, at least when your siblings developed it later. So I'm wondering, did you talk to her? Were you talking to her about it? And how, how's her relationship with you and your parents? Uh, she's, um, she's, um, I don't talk to her very often, but I, I mean, I, I talk to her about that. Um, and she, I don't know how she deals with it. She's very angry all the time, and I mm -hmm. think that's coming from it. So um, every time that the topic of you know our sensitivity to chewing noises shows up, it's just just mentioning the topic to her makes her angry. Wow, that's sad. She probably has yeah, it. Uh, so it's really hard. To have yeah. a, yeah, it's really hard to have a productive, calm discussion around that without you know devolving into um, like just angry talk. Uh, gotcha. And that's exhausting for me. So at some point, I just have to shield myself from that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and have you? Um, so other than you, kind of your uh, coping mechanisms, have you tried like uh, um, other therapies or like seeing therapists and even um, audiologists about it? So I tried um, the Trigger Tamer app from Tom Dozier. I don't know if you've tried. I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, didn't work on me. <laughs> um, didn't work at all. Um, yeah. it, was, it was hard. Um, so is I, that I kind get, of like a, is it kind of like an AMSR kind of thing where it introduces sounds? I'm, I'm not, I forget how it works. It's so, so the idea is that you find your trigger and then it's uh, exposing you to the trigger yeah. gradually, you know, increasing the intensity of the trigger gradually. Um, and I guess it would work for, or it, at least it's been shown to work on some people. So um, I think maybe it depends on how strong your response to misophonia is and maybe, you know, how long you have, you've had it. Um, so I've looked a bit into that. It didn't work on me. Um, uh, I'm talking to a therapist um, about both things. Um, 
I tried CBT, didn't work. Um, I tried meditation. Um, meditation on me didn't work. Actually, it made things <laughs> make things more difficult. Um, how, how how did you do that? Did it uh, were you hearing triggers during the meditation, or um, was it giving you a false sense of security? Maybe after it's um, it felt like every time I was meditating, I was actually pulling on an elastic band, you know, just building something. And when I stopped meditating, just you know, letting go of the elastic. <laughs> And so it wasn't uh, wasn't any long term effect. It was. I was just more sensitive after. Gotcha. So uh, that wasn't good. So I looked into um, into all kind of things like that, and then again listening to um, the work from Tom Dozier on that, and also reading a bit into you know, neuroscience and how the brain works. Um, I started reading about the the default mode network. Uh, you might have heard about that. No, uh, I, yeah, I don't think so. You want to talk about the, that? The right? default mode network, which is uh, a very nice way of describing a set of structures in the brain that are responsible for trying to reconcile the, you know, the sensory data that you're perceiving every day all the time and uh, your own idea of reality. Uh, I'm trying to put that in layman's term. It's, uh, it's a reconciliation engine between what you feel and what the real world around you is basically. Yeah, uh, and, it's, and it's a very useful thing to have from an evolutionary perspective, because, you know, if you feel that the water is cold, and, and you know, most likely it is cold, you know, if you feel that it's warm, most likely it's warm, you know, so it's um, those structures that are con constantly trying to reconcile what you feel and how, you know, how you build reality from those fear from those sensations. Um, and the thing is, when when that default mode network is um, um, running normally, there's no issue. But then we, what we've observed in people who suffer from anxiety or depression is that there's some kind of like, imbalance in those structures. So it starts overriding everything else and it starts running wild instead of being regulated by other parts of the brain. Um, and I thought maybe that's, maybe misophonia is linked to that. Uh, maybe there is something here, maybe that, um, that, that um, trigger processing cycle that uh, Dozier describes in his work, um, maybe it's linked a bit to, uh, to that. So I started researching it uh, and thinking, okay, what can I do then to try to uh, cool off my default mode network and not letting it run wild? Uh, maybe that would help. Um, and uh, I, I, I heard that meditation would be one way of doing it and that you know, expert meditators um, have usually, you know, those parts of, the brain, of their brain running in a different way than people who don't meditate. Uh, but I, I never managed to get into meditation, really, uh, until very recently. I, I did something a bit radical for that. Um, I attended a retreat, uh, an ayahuasca retreat, which affected a bit the way uh, I'm, I'm thinking about misophonia now. Um, I don't know if you've had anyone else talking to you about that. Um, oh, that's good. Yeah, I've had. Uh, I haven't gone, but I've. I have. I know from, uh, from some friends who have, and they uh, they love it. Um, well, I wouldn't say I love it. <laughs> yeah, I would say they say they love it. I, I'm not going to give it any. Um, it's, yeah. not, it's not. It's not by any means universal. It's uh, no, and I and I wouldn't recommend it to. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it as a like as a cure or a solution or anything. And it definitely didn't remove my triggers, it just made my reactions to trigger very different. It feels very different now. So uh, something I did like uh, over a month ago, so it was an ayahuasca retreat. So just one night of um, taking ayahuasca, sleeping on it. And then uh, the day after uh, trying DMT, um, which is an, an active component of that. And that um, that definitely had an impact on me. Um, so the misophonia is still there, but the, the way I, I get angry from the triggers feels very different now. It feels a lot more manageable. Oh, interesting. And it, um, Is it slower to come on or is it not as intense, but it's still there? It's still there, but I feel less, I, I, feel, I feel more disconnected from the anger. 
if that makes any sense. You know, uh, before that, I would say the anger would take over me, and that's all that I, that's all I would be. Like, I would become anger. <laughs> right. Like, uh, literally, would be consumed by it. Um, even if I were trying to, you know, draw on my notebooks, you know, like you know, focus on something else. You've seen my drawings. They're not happy drawings, you know? Um, no, they're not. <laughs> um, and, and, and then after that, just thinking about what had happened would make me angry again. Um, but now it, I feel a lot more disconnected from that. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's as if it had created a, a gap somewhere between the actual trigger and my response to it and finally my, you know, how I remember my response to it. Hmm. Uh, and, and that gap is just enough for me to think okay but it's over now i don't need to still feel angry you know that okay that person was chewing loudly during that meeting that that was hell but now it's over it's fine um, that's, that's the kind of that's the kind of thought that would have consumed me before like i, I would feel angry for hours after that yeah right oh, that's, so that's it, it, had an, yeah, it had an impact on me and um i think it's something that we're lucky with that today we have all these um, you know brain brain scan technologies that we can use and uh, there seems to be some kind of re-emergence of the study of psychedelics uh, in neuroscience and you know how, how they can help better understand how the brain works so ho hopefully one day we'll fully understand how it works and come you know, with something to manage that yeah, that's interesting. I'm curious to see how that's going to uh, evolve for you. If this is this is like a, a kind of a permanent change for you, or it kind of yeah. steps back, or yeah, be be curious to to hear how yeah, that I'm really goes. Yeah, really promising. It's quite recent, so I said it's uh, it's been a month now. Um, and and again, if I if I see or hear someone chewing, I still feel the anger, but it feels it feels dis I feel a bit disconnected from the anger, and you know, just enough. To take a step back from it and you know, don't let it consume me or take over me, um, which is a huge change. Yeah, that sounds very promising. Yeah, mm. that, that's uh, that's a huge relief uh, because you know, otherwise it's just not manageable. And um, yeah. that that had affected misophonia had affected like all aspect of my life. You know, I have a five and a half year old, and I've never really been able to sit down at the same table. And eat with her. Ah, oh, so she's triggering. She's been triggering you as well. Yeah, okay. it's, it's really hard to explain. You know, a young child. You know, please right. chew your mouth closed. Oh. And it was just unbearable. Just impossible for me to be in the same room. Um, and and the thing is, um, it, apparently, I'm really good at building new triggers. Um, yeah, so I, many of us are. Yeah. Uh, and again, when you when you look at uh, the, um, the the process that uh, Dozier has outlined for how misophonia works, it's uh, it's quite easy to understand how how it's possible to acquire new triggers. Um, and I, I've seen that with, uh, with my kid. So she was making me so it feels so bad from the noises she was making when she was eating. After that, it was just just seeing the kid would make me feel the same way. Mm -hmm. And and that's terrible. That 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 felt horrible because on top of the uh, you know, the bad feeling that was triggered by misophonia, you also have the um, the anxiety of you know, I'm a terrible dad. <laughs> yeah, well, that's uh, the guilt and the shame that uh, a yeah. lot of us feel in different ways. Yeah, and and um, and I had a similar situation with um, with an ex girlfriend actually, well, the one who uh, showed me quiet please. Um, she she tried to be really good at not making noises when she was eating, uh, which I appreciated. But then she was so careful. It's, it's it's paradoxical, you know. When somebody's so careful trying not to make noises, it gets on your nerves. Yeah. And then she um, she did also that thing with the you know the the nails tapping on the screen of a smartphone. <laughs> Doing typing or just kind of uh, for fun? No, just, you know when you're typing a text or yeah. something. So she, yeah. she had long nails and her nails were tapping on the phone, and that I had never been bothered by that noise, like ever. That had never triggered me in any way. Uh, 
But then I noted, and I've reflected on that, you know, why did I develop that trigger with that one person? And it's because every time she would you know, sit in a corner, in the opposite corner of the sofa, spending, you know, a lot of time on her phone instead of being with me, you know, mentally being with me, I would feel that sense of rejection, you know, like, okay, what's wrong here? Like, you know, she, she's not, you know, she's closing down or she's, you know, shutting me off. That doesn't feel good. And I, I somehow associated that bad feeling with that tapping noise on the screen. Mm. And um, that, that follows exactly the trigger, acquire, um, trigger acquisition process that Dozier described. So when, when, I, when I found his work and I started to look into it, I'm like, okay, so that's what happened. Like, I felt really bad and I associated that noise with that really bad feeling. Gotcha. And I think that's why we need, we need to be a bit careful with all those, you know, acquired triggers because it's so easy to build new ones. And uh, it, I, I would say it's difficult enough with, you know, chewing noises only. <laughs> um, we don't need more. Yeah. You know, being aware of those things, you know, being aware that okay, you're, you're feeling really bad because that person is doing this, but maybe there's something else. I mean, to me, now it's clear, it's not really the tapping of the phone that was making me angry. It was her attitude of not being with me, you know, mentally available when she was there. Like, yeah, interesting. So, and somehow your, yeah, your, your brain made that connection. I mean, it's also, it is also, um, I guess it, it could be kind of related to fight or flight. It's just kind of a loss of security or a feeling of a loss of security, maybe. Yeah, it's something makes you feel bad, in a way. Yeah. And then your, part of your brain is looking for something in your environment to justify that bad feeling. And the easy thing to latch onto is a sensory trigger. So it might be a noise, it might be a smell, you know, it might be something you see. Um, but it has to be something that has some kind of frequency to it. Uh, also something that Dozier describes, that it's um, like sensory input that has some kind of frequency to it. And uh, mm -hmm. chewing noises, for example, fall into that perfect window of a few seconds of frequency. Right. People make that noise with a few seconds apart. And uh, that makes it really, uh, really easy for the brain to, to, pick, to pick it up and say, oh, that's the, th that's the thing that makes me feel bad, actually. Also, the, um, the physical sensations of misophonia is something I, I wasn't aware of before. I was just focusing on the anger. Um, like but after, your, your physical sensation or, or sensing or being triggered by physical movement? No, the, the, the physical sensations after being triggered. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, tell me about that. So to me, it's, it's like a tension in the chest. Like I uh, almost hold my breath. When I feel somebody, when I hear somebody chewing, I've noticed that now that, that my first reaction is to almost block my breath. Gotcha. My, my chest gets really tense. It's like having a rope between my throat and my stomach that gets pulled on and gets mm -hmm. really tight. But I've seen from Dozier's work that other people have completely different physical reactions. Like some of them have like a twitch in their foot or in the hands or the neck, you know, could be anything. But his work has shown that there's always some kind of physical response first. And his theory is that that physical response is the, the first thing actually that happened. And then that you know, not so nice physical response turned into an emotional response that we acquire and then associate with the trigger. So holding your breath, you know, feeling that your chest is not able to really take the air in. Yeah somehow triggers a stress reaction. And gotcha. then if that stress reaction is, you know, the, if you associate that stress reaction with the sound of chewing, then you don't even need the physical reaction first. You just hear the sound and then, okay, you feel as if you were unable to breathe. Yeah, your brain jumps a couple of steps. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Which now is clearer to me than, than it ever was. Uh, and I wish, again, I wish I had known that, you know, years ago. Because now I pay much more attention to those things, um, which helps tremendously, actually. Yeah, I'm going to start doing that. I, I mean, yeah, I don't know what happens. I think I feel like I seize up or, or I know my brain can't stop thinking about anything else. But there is um, there's a good chance that, you know, you haven't noticed yet. Yeah. Uh, 
physical response to it. You know, you haven't located yet what, what it is. But. I'm going to go and try to get triggered right after this uh, call. And then, <laughs> no. Yeah, but that's yeah. Uh, that, that's the tricky part. I mean, you don't want to go through that. Right. I, I trust me, it won't take long. I'm, I'm sure in the next half hour, I'll get triggered by something. Cool. Well, Jill, I mean, this was, yeah, this has been fascinating conversation from front to end. Um, and do you have anything? Yeah. Do you have any uh, other insights or anything else you want to, yeah. you want to say? <laughs> I'd love to have you back on at some point after you've done more, if you do more uh, ayahuasca to see how that um, affects you. But yeah, anything else you want to, you want to say? Um, there's something I, I'm trying now. Uh, again, I've been reading a lot about brain plasticity. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm, I've been reading about that too. And uh, the effect of working out on brain plasticity. Um, and apparently when you work out, your brain is, um, is easier to rewire in some way. Um, so if I, you know, if I'm being a bit extreme, if you work out feeling angry or, you know, with only angry thoughts, you're, you know, fostering those angry patterns in your brain. But if you train with happy thoughts, you will kind of, you know, wire your brain for happiness. I mean, that's a growth, growth exaggeration. But that's the idea. No, yeah, but that's the idea. Inter interesting. Yeah. Okay. So I'm thinking now maybe um, it's, it's an experience I'm testing on myself. Um, I'm trying to have some kind of mental theme every time I work out. Um, trying to, it's almost a meditation thing. I'm trying to think about something like, you know, gratitude, for example or peace or something like that and yeah. every time i catch myself not thinking about that in the gym i, I bring myself back to it and um i've been doing that for a few weeks now um and, and i'm documenting a bit how i feel and if it helps but i'm really curious to see if it has if that kind of thing has a long-term long-term effect on the brain yeah that's fascinating i mean plasticity is real and um yeah, be oh, yeah. curious to see how it affects how, how it affects you. So, I mean, if, if you, prove, yeah, yeah, if we're able to prove that you know working out can help with Alzheimer's and Parkinson and things like that, you know, maybe we can you know use use that to do something before those diseases or to do something else. That might be my best motivation to go work out. Actually, <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> if, it, if it somehow cures misophonia or or helps blunt it. Cool. Um, well, Jill, uh, again, yeah. Glad to, glad to have you on here. And uh, yeah, this, this, is, this has been great. And uh, good luck with everything. And, and yeah, let's, let's keep in touch. I really want to hear how some of these things uh, progress for you. Yeah, I would be more than happy to, uh, to come back on. And again, a big thank you for everything you've done. Uh, I mean, it's, um, you can't imagine how happy I was when I found your podcast. It was like somebody's talking about that. You know, it's out there. Uh, there are others talking about it openly. Um, also, it's never, you know, in a victim sense, you know, I mean, uh, of course we have sad stories and, you know, there's right. a lot of suffering that comes with it, but it, it, it's mostly, you know, inspiring stories of people who have been able to cope with it or, you know, like stories we can empathize with. It, it's not about being a victim, really. It's about finding a way to live with that thing. No, that's the, that was the whole point. I got sick of those, uh, those articles with the nasty pictures on, you know, CNN or other podcasts where it's it's just oh who are these who are these let's talk let's tell you about these weirdos it's um it was, this podcast was inspired by you know conversations a lot of hilarious conversations with other sufferers at uh conventions and whatnot so it's just yeah. great just wanted to have a regular conversation so yeah and thank you for spreading the word so much on uh instagram and whatnot it all helps yeah I'm, I'm not, i mean i feel like it's um it's the least i can do um, and also, so, you know, maybe um, maybe there is something with people with misophonia that you know, in the way we process information, in the way we think, maybe we, you know, maybe if we can just get rid of the suffering, maybe we we can do you know, good things. Maybe we have you know ways of thinking. You know, maybe it's not a coincidence that there are so many engineers, for example. Yeah. <laughs> Or so many people who have like artistic interests, you know, whether it's music or drawing or you know, things like that, uh, with, among people with misophonia. So, yeah, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration. The world, the world would be a better place, uh, not just yeah. because it's less annoying sounds, but I think there we have a lot of um, potential energy that 
that would help. Yeah, if we could spend that energy on something else, then trying not to smash somebody's face because yeah. he or she is chewing a gum, <laughs> maybe we could do something better. It's, uh... I love that. Let's let's end on that note. And yeah. uh, I'm inspired for the rest of the day. Um, yeah. Well, again, yeah, again, Jill, thanks. And um, yeah, good, good luck with everything. Thank you so much. Keep up the good work. Thanks again, Jill. I wanted to keep going and I really hope we can talk again. I might have to visit Sweden post lockdown. If you're enjoying these shows, please hit the five stars in iTunes or leave a review if you like. Remember to check the show notes for links to the Misophonia Association for info on the convention coming later this year. Music, as always, is by Moby. And until next week, wishing you peace and quiet.